The following is a call with Harlan Miller. Hey, man. Hello. Hey, how are you doing? Good, good. How are you doing? I'm doing good. Excellent, excellent. So, since the last time we talked, um, I was able to find an abandoned bank, actually, with... And I asked the guy, I was like, hey, if I could find a tenant for you, could I manage it for you? And he was like, sure. And I just, I'm wondering if you know anything about, like, managing commercial properties at all. Um, managing a bank and finding a client, not really in my wheelhouse. Okay. Um... So yeah, that one is outside. Um, I'm mostly residential, you know, real estate. Yeah. So. What about, so you have people that work for you, obviously. Um, yes. How many, I guess what would be the ratio of properties managed to like property manager? Um, well, it depends on your model. So basically you can have what's more of like a, so there's a couple of ways you can structure it. I was actually just on a call with this, uh, you know, with some experts in my, you know, in, in this field. Um, so like one of my friends who I actually like his model, how he structures it is he's the broker and he brings on a property manager. And usually, so he's got managers that manage I think his lowest person manages 30 because they don't really do it as a full-time position. He's got one that manages like 70 and then his biggest one's like 130. Mm. Usually the most, especially if you're going to be doing, you know, and this is all like tenants, not like commercial. So this is like, yeah. you know, you go and manage a house for somebody, you manage a townhouse or a condo. About the most that anybody I've heard of can get out of a manager is about 150, but that's with some support. That's not like them doing everything, you know. So you're probably going to have a, a receptionist answering the phone or somebody that's, you know, dealing with some of the aspects. But that person would handle acquiring new owners, um, dealing with getting it rented, dealing with maintenance issues, and kind of handling that. So pretty much every aspect with some back end support. Generally, the rule we have as owners, so you're going to start your company and become a property manager, is usually until you get to, depending on which type of units and the revenue you're doing, I probably wouldn't do more than 50 units and then be able to look to hire, like, you know, whatever you hate to do most, to be honest with you, um, or whatever pays the least. Mm -hmm. So what generally pays the least is answering the phone and kind of doing admin work. It's not a high dollar value job. Um, and a lot of times you can even outsource that, you know, to other countries and do virtual employees. Um, now, the other way you can structure is that you, you again, grow a portfolio so you can afford it. And the first hire that you maybe do is uh, a property manager who manages the operations, but maybe you stay in the growth. Maybe you're the one that's going out and acquiring new clients. Mm -hmm. um, and then you're going to build out from underneath them. So you're going to bring them on. You guys are going to work together to build out systems and processes and everything. And then you're going to bring on uh, maybe you eventually bring on a leasing agent. And then maybe you bring on a maintenance coordinator or you bring on, a, you know, a tenant relationship expert or whatever. You know, there's multiple different roles you can have. Yeah. But, you know, but if you look at it, it depends on. So if we ran some simple numbers, you know, ultimately, like I kind of told you, let's say you got a hundred units and they average $3,000 a month in rent and you've got a 10% management fee. So you're going to make, you know, $30,000 a month, $360,000 a year. Obviously there's other ways you can make revenue, but let's just keep it to that. Okay. Well, obviously you can have expenses. If you're managing that many units, you're going to have software, you're going to have some advertising, you're going to have, you know, whatever. So let's say that you net out, if you're running your business really well, you're probably running about a 30 to 40% expense ratio. So let's just make it 40. So you, you're going to take out 40% of 360,000. So what is that? Oh, 632, it's about 150,000. So you're going to have about, you know, 150, 
you know, I mean, I'm sure you're gonna have about $200,000 profit. Okay, well, you gotta then go, well, do I wanna keep it all myself and work really hard or do I wanna hire a manager? And a manager's probably gonna cost you for a really good one, $70,000 a year plus bonuses. Yeah. You know, so you might say, I wanna make a hundred grand, I got a really good manager and um, I don't have to do much now though, you know? Yeah. Um, you know, it really depends on what you want out of it or how big you want to grow it or all that. Those are questions, you know, you probably want to know because generally the good part of it is is saying, okay, this is where I want to be in five years and then working towards that. If you're not clear and you want to be in five years, it's tough to get anywhere. Yeah. You know, so you got to kind of, that's a hard question to ask other than, yes, if you had 100 units, you could afford to have a, a property manager come in and run most of that for you and uh, maybe with a little bit of back-end support, you know? Because mm-hmm. you don't really want them handling every incoming call you want. There's some filters you want. You know, you don't want your your $80,000 person being answered a bunch of calls from bad tenant leads. So you're going to want to filter out what gets to them. Yeah. Um, you know, even the same with you. It's hard because when you first start out, hey, I don't have any clients, so i got to take every call. But yeah. then you kind of want to get really good at getting people off the phone. Yeah, you know, letting you know, them you do their work. You don't want to... Um, you don't want to get stuck on a 30 minute phone call with a tenant that doesn't qualify or with an owner that doesn't have a unit that they really want managed, right? Mm-hmm. So, um, you know, now I give you props for going out and finding a vacant bank and making that, but you know, there's probably, probably if you wanted to call somebody on that, you probably want to call like a, just call up any of the bigger real estate companies, Keller Williams, you know, Kai's, any of these companies say, Hey, can I talk to your commercial real estate guy? And they would be able to talk to you more about that side of things. Okay. Um, what about, so do you have any like tips for someone like me, for example, to get a landlord to trust me with their properties since I don't really have anything to say, well, I've, I've given these people a good service. Like how, how could well, I get I mean, them to trust me? I guess me one thing that? that I would say is, I know, I know you had an interview you said last week with a broker where maybe you're going to go and work with them and probably manage with anything come of that. Um, the, he said he's still figuring out the details with his team. So he doesn't have a property management division right now or something? or was No, the, they're, they're starting one. Gotcha. Well, so I mean, obviously, when you're, if you're managing for others, you have to work under a broker. So I know I think you had maybe initially said, and if I'm wrong, you know, forgive me, but that you are going to hold it under maybe a buddy's license. Well, here's the thing, if your buddy has no reputation, even though he may say, hey, I'm not going to touch any of your money, that may not be your best option. I mean, going and hanging your hat with, say, Keller Williams or Kai's or Caldwell Banker, those are companies that everybody knows and they have a reputation, good or bad. Mm-hmm. And so you may be better off going to a broker that's more known and saying, hey, even though they might take 10%, their name recognition alone gives them credibility, right? Mm -hmm. Or maybe they just have more bells and whistles they could give you. Maybe there's an office you can go to and use computers or meet clients at. That gives you credibility. Obviously, if you're like, hey, we always got to meet at Starbucks, um, it probably kind of makes it look like you don't have an office to go to, which is true, right? Yeah. You know, so um, so those are kind of things you got to kind of think out. I would say that... You know, we all started with that first deal. I guess number one is do what you're doing. You know, go in and be able to speak intelligently. Um, Google things like top 20 rejections a property owner has when hiring a management company and know the answers to those things. Okay. You know, like be, be conscious enough of what they're going to what is their, their concern? And here's the thing, your greatest thing that they might bring up is, well, if they meet you in person, they're gonna be like, hey, you look like a kid. Yeah. You know, why would I trust you? Be like, well, 
here's the reality of who I am. I'm not like other kids. I'm maybe even say, you know, I mean, I guess you're not a millennial. I don't even know what your generation's called, but it's like, hey, I'm not like all these kids that are wanting to be lazy. I, you could even tell them about me and say, hey, you know what? I've been mentoring with a guy because I really want to be great at this. I didn't dive right into it. We do a call every week. You could even have them call me to verify that. Those are things that give you credibility. That's different. That's unusual. Like I told you, you're the first person to ever call me about wanting to be a student on property management i get all sorts of people that call me that want to learn how to buy real estate yeah because that's sexy and exciting property management's just kind of like hey i'm i'm building something but it's not pretty it's not sexy nobody's like oh you do property management you're hot yeah. <laughs> I mean, like, it's like you know so i'm just saying like all those things give you some credibility over anybody your age yeah you know also remind them that everybody has to start somewhere and that usually people that are starting out are pretty dedicated to wanting their clients to be happy because your reputation starts with that first client, right? Yeah, it does. You know, so you're going to want to say to them, hey, I'm going to come in and kill it for you because I want you to give me a five-star review. I want you to be my reference. I'm going to, you know, ask you to do that if I'm doing a good job after three months, you know, and then mm -hmm. do it. You want to build your reputation on Google. You want to, you know, like it's hard for to get your team to do it, but like I have to incentivize my team like, hey, the tenant just gave us, because we have internal review systems, but like the tenant just gave us an internal five star. Let's get that on the Yelp. Let's get that on the Google, you know, and, uh, you know, but I've got to usually incentivize my team. Well, you, you got to be willing to ask that client, even if he's your only one, hey, can you go write me a five star review? Yeah. You'd be surprised that one five star review will maybe even get you some clients. Yeah. You know, um, because people do go to the internet, like, I don't know how you get, you do it, but like when we go out to choose a new restaurant, we're going to go look and see what their reviews are. Yeah. You know, if they're on 3.2, probably not eating there. Mm -hmm. You know, so I would say that don't let the age thing be anything more than, hey, it is something I have to consider. But then if you can sit down to them and intelligently talk to them about, you know, you know, well, what are you looking, you know, because... I ask a lot of questions because I'm in the business, but you might, you know, they might ask you, well, how do you choose tenants? Well, you probably need to have an answer, you mm -hmm. know? So you, you, you got to go in with some upfront research, like, well, how am I going to do background checks? Um, how am I going to, you know, account for the money when it comes in, mm -hmm. you know, um, you know, what should I charge though? Now I sincerely say that you know again in real estate we can't say that it's 10 percent. that's you know we that's probably pricing you know, we we're not allowed to say that anything's a certain set percentage but i wouldn't i wouldn't recommend for you to manage properties for much less than that if they're residential okay because you know? if you do you're gonna have a hard time hiring and, and growing yeah what uh how do you do the background checks like what criteria is there to qualify a tenant well you know um you um can only really look at you can look at credit credit scores you can look at their previous you know landlord situation so one thing i would use which i think gives clients a comfort feeling is you you do want to call the tenant's most recent landlord, but the best one to talk to if they've lived in more than one rental is the one before. So I always require my tenants to get give me their last two or three landlords. Mm -hmm. Why? Because here's the truth, Matthew. If I'm a landlord and I want to get rid of you because you're a bad tenant, I'm going to give you a good review possibly to get rid of you. Yeah. If you screwed over the guy before me, and I call him, he's gonna tell me the truth about you because you're already gone. Yeah, that's smart. Being, saying that to an owner, because here's the truth, most property management companies are lazy and they're just gonna call the current landlord, right? Mm -hmm. Telling an owner that and, and then, you know, sometimes they'll be like, sometimes they don't even get why, and so I actually usually say things with a little explanation. Hey, I just want to let you know that we do things and you may want to ask these questions if you're interviewing other people, you know, that to, to manage a property is, do they just call the most recent landlord? Just ask them that. Say, how do you, how do you um, background check the owner or the, the tenant? Mm -hmm. And if they don't say that they go to the second landlord, if there is one, guess what? The first landlord has a propensity to lie because they want to get rid of a bad tenant. Yeah. I go to the second one because they're going to tell me the truth every time. 
Mm -hmm. That's a little nuance that a lot of people don't think about. You know, um, you're going to pull criminal. So you're going to pull criminal. Now you got to be careful with criminal. And here's where one other thing you want to study because you're new is fair housing. You need to understand fair housing rules. There's a lot of free online classes for it you can take. There's a lot of things from the associations and real estate you can take. You got to know what HUD does because you can get in big trouble in this industry. Like you can't t deny every felon. You can only deny felons that are a certain time has passed, a certain this, but, you, you know, felons, you know, there they used to be if you somebody had a, a felony, you could deny them forever if you wanted. Yeah. Well, that's not the case anymore. And here's the thing. They don't give you any rules. They just say you can't do it. Mm. So they don't say, well, it's five years, it's this and that. They're like, no, you just have to give them an opportunity. And so you have to say, um, hey, but you can set a rule, like our rule's five years. We just say it's five years. Now I could get in trouble for that, but I think it's safe enough, you know, based on what my attorney said. So we say, if you had a, if you had a felony, but it can't be any felony, it has to be like theft, which obviously you don't want people stealing if they're living in property. Um, you know, violence, drugs, those three are probably the main ones. But if you were, I don't know what else with the felony you could get in trouble for, maybe reckless driving that one might be a hard one to argue with uh you know hud if they came and did an investigation like if somebody said you were you know being biased or racist or something you know they said well the reason i deny it was because they had a reckless driving felony charge yeah that doesn't really associate with um keeping a property or paying rent so yeah. you probably get in trouble for that make sense yeah that makes so sense the felony has to be a risk to the property or to the neighbors like if it was a multifamily. Mm. You know? so um you know and usually how you go do that well see we have a software platform called that folio which you probably wouldn't want to get until you have at least 30 units like some a, a great property management software so you're probably gonna have to go and what you have to do is if you're with a brokerage and they have background check abilities which they might because they might be managing properties for their owners you can use that there's one that i think a lot of realtors use i forget the name of it but again your broker could tell you that i just don't do it because I'm, I'm i'm not in sales on that i'm doing just full property management. but there are a resource available to you usually through your broker um depending on who you go with or you can call the realtors association and get references from them because you're probably going to need to get an in independent company that does you know criminal they'll you know they'll do criminal they'll give you the credit report they'll do that mm -hmm. yeah um so and then you just got to have criteria you know okay. what, what are you, you going to turn away you don't want to put every tenant in you you know um how much deposit are you going to take you know in this market it's a little tough to get first last of security even though that's generally the norm you know um so there's a lot of things you gotta think about there but you just want to give them confidence that you're going to make sure and do a lot of homework before you just hand over the keys to somebody mm -hmm. you know. um what about how does the process of so you bring on a new client who let's say they have 10 properties yeah. how does what does the process look like of you actually taking over the responsibility of like managing it like talking to current tenants uh getting new keys uh talking to current vendors like yeah so i mean number one obviously step one is you reach agreement you're going to have them obviously sign your management contract and it's going to lay out your accountability and responsibility in theirs so in my management contract it, it puts the responsibility on them to give me the keys for those 10 units so they're going to go collect them if they don't have them they're going to provide them they're going to make you know sure they work and you know i'd put working keys in there because a lot of times they don't work as tenants change locks yeah. and they would bring you a bag or a box or whatever where they say, hey, here's the keys for the 10 properties. Um, if they use current vendors and they want you to consider using them or whatever, you know, whatever, if they have a, you know, if it's a 10 unit building, they have a landscaper, they have a pool guy, if there's a pool, you know, hey, they, they should provide you a list with name, contact number, et cetera. So, you know, other than that, you're probably not gonna get much from the tenants unless there's any um, additional rooms, maybe there's a storage room you need a key for, or a garage or something, obviously you gotta get all that and then you gotta you know ultimately at some point you know for now you can keep them in your desk drawer or whatever but you know you get bigger you're gonna get 
you know, a lock box to keep the keys in. And eventually you're going to get like we have, a, at, you know, because I manage mostly association association has a fingerprint box. So even to get a key, you have to put your fingerprint. It records that you took the key and, you know, there's a camera there watching so that they know which key you took. Mm-hmm. And, uh, you know, you got to put it back and all that. But I'm saying when you're starting out, you're going to have a guy give you 10 keys. You're going to want to go to Home Depot. You're going to want to get a labeler. Usually people just get those little um, paper ones with the ring around it, the metal ring and you write the unit and build a number and you put it into a you know i like i used to use like a tackle box or any like a little tote with like little compartments yeah um, there's like the two-sided ones and you can usually fit about 100 keys in there that each have their own thing and you just label them and now you keep that and now whenever you go anywhere you get the keys to all your properties um you know okay. um but you're gonna want to kind of think about these things and so you know if i was taking a new property first i'm gonna get my contract signed if it's a single family house i'm gonna want to make sure i understand any like you said who are the vendors are there any nuances because sometimes like oh well you know they, you know where's the shut off valves things like that you're gonna want to go through the property with the owner and be like okay let's learn some properties have tricks like <laughs> you know this switch over here actually runs that light which makes no sense because my electrician didn't run it right you know they're just yeah we'll just have weirdnesses to them right um you know i don't want anybody to use this you'd want to look at anything personal that the proper owner might have left because anything personal really shouldn't be there unless it's locked up because you don't know if the tenant's going to use it seal it sell it mm-hmm. so like I, I tr- you want to go through that obviously once I take over a property, I always go in, even if it has tenants, and I photograph everything in real time because you want to know that what condition it was in when you took it over mm. so that nobody ever accuses you of anything in the future. Oh, when I had you start managing this property, it was in perfect condition. I'll look at it. No, it wasn't. It was it was beat up. It was bad. Um, you know, you're going to want to put that all into a file. I just think like using like a, you know, Dropbox or Google or whatever you want to use is, is fine as long as it's labeled and organized, you know, but you want to get, you're going to want to get a little intimate with the property, you know, so go through, take some pictures. I would right away get the ages of like the AC, the hot water heater, things that can go out and break because, you know, you also want to be a guide for the owner say, hey, you know, your, your AC is 17 years old. I just want to put it in your ear that, probably going to go out pretty soon. Mm-hmm. You no, know, make sure you're prepared financially for that. You know, same with a hot water heater. Um, you know, I'm not I'm just saying you have to be a complete expert, but you want to look at some of these things because it also makes you look like an expert, right? Yeah. Um, and then, um, I mean, that's kind of being on the intake. You're going to want to have an intake kind of process sheet like that lays it out for the owner. So it's like, okay, now that we've signed a contract, I need you to do A, B, and C, and I'm going to do X, Y, Z. You know, um, you're going to want to figure out how you're going to, where you're going to put the money when it comes in. Like, you can't put it in your personal bank account. You got to put it into a business escrow account. Um, You know, you could manage early on that the money goes directly to them, but then the problem is every time you need to spend 10 bucks on a toilet, you know, stopper or something, you have to go to them for money. That's a nightmare. Yeah. You know, so you're probably going to want to set up a security deposit account and you're going to want to set up, a, you know, a, an owner escrow account. And then when the money comes in, you put it in there and now you have to, you know, have the accounting for it, whether you use you know, QuickBooks or whatever until you get up to a bigger software like I use which isn't cost effective. In fact, they wouldn't even let you buy it, you know, now with one unit. Hmm. Um, you know, but ultimately you're going to have to have some recording model because the owner is going to want you to give them a statement at the end of the month. And I do know that QuickBooks or some of these plays do have like small management modules. I think there's even maybe some free or very inexpensive ones, but they're only good until you get up to like maybe 50 units and then they're just not capable of handling the volume. Yeah. You know, but, but you kind of want to have that because you want to be able to send that owner a report every month and say, hey, here's what the rent was, here's the expenses for my management fee, whatever. And that should be in their inbox every month so that they, you know, know what they collected and what they spent. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, you're going to want to be able to give them a year end tax statement that says, hey, you, you brought in this much income, these are your expenses, so they can get back to their account. Mm hmm. You know, so you got to have a software that does at least enough of that or, or the ability to do that through some sort of a spreadsheet system that works. 
Okay. What about... I don't know. I mean, this probably doesn't happen often. But what would... What would you do if something breaks and the landlord just doesn't want to pay for it? Well, so in your agreement as well, these are things you do. The agreement is really what gets you a good relationship. So in the agreement, my agreement is going to say, hey, whatever worked and functioned when the tenant moved in must work and function until the lease is up. Mm. So, like, I think I maybe even gave you an example. I've had owners that had a nice, huge 24 cubic foot fridge with ice maker, big freezer, big that. And, you know, they're around 1800 bucks, and then it goes out because it's old. And then they, I go, okay, well, we're going to go replace this. And now they're 2000 bucks. And the owner's like, oh, no, just put in a, a up and down fridge for like 600 bucks. I'm like, no, 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 no. Mm-hmm. We, we're not going to do that. The tenant moved in with this beautiful nice fridge it was one of the things they even mentioned when they moved in of how much they liked the place because they got three kids and now you're wanting them to get a little 16 cubic foot fridge no we're not going to do that well that's in my contract like we replace things with light kind components and i might even list if the fridge stove dishwasher goes out we're going to replace them with similar quality style you know replacements if uh you know if the garage you know i mean again and you just gotta kind of say anything that is broken will be paid for by the owner and then i would put another thing in there and we will pursue the tenant if it was caused by them mm. you know now with that said probably the meeting that i have a lot to remind my employees of is we're there to protect that owner so you know when something does get broken by a tenant and we know that they did it um we have to go after them and get it collected you know like i'll give you an example i literally had a tenant crack a countertop in their kitchen well that was like a two thousand dollar replacement damn so but so they paid for that well now just recently they ripped the door off of their vanity and these are like two 50 year old women i'm like what are you guys doing like you know but again they put in a work order to fix it. I made my team go back and say, no, doors don't just get ripped out of the sides of vanities. You're going to have to pay for this. And if not, we're either A, not going to fix it now, but we're going to fix it when you move out and we're going to take it from your deposit. Or yeah. if you want it fixed now, to replace that whole vanity, because they really did a number on it, it's going to be like 800 bucks. Yeah. So you always have to make the tenant accountable for everything that they've done to the unit that they shouldn't have. Hmm. You know, so always remember that you can't go to the owner if a tenant, you know, like I'll give you an example, it happens, the toilet doesn't flush or it doesn't flow right, it just won't have the water. Well, almost never in Florida do we have enough corrosive water that it's going to build up and, and block a toilet. It's generally because of foreign object. They put a tampon down the toilet there, a kid dropped a matchbox part down the toilet and it gets stuck in the, in the, in the trap inside, inside the toilet. Yeah. Uh, that's on them. They need to pay for the new toilet and the installation. Yeah. Blinds, a big one with blinds. You don't know real how many times tenants bend, break blinds on windows. That's on them. Yeah. You know, now here's the thing. If I have a tenant that lived in a unit for five years and the blinds broke and, I, and they were plastic, I'm probably not going to charge them with a couple of the, the blinds are broken because they get brittle in the Florida sun and they break. So there is a little bit of discernment here. Mm-hmm. And that's only going to come with you for time. A lot of things I'm telling you is because I've done this for 20 some years. You're going to walk in and go, OK, I'm not exactly sure. You might not even have probably on day one aren't going to think that the sun really does a lot of damage to the blinds they get really bl- brittle and they're going to crack mm-hmm. but you also be able to explain that to your owner because the owner is going to push back you're going to go and you're going to charge them 30 bucks plus labor for some blinds they go why would i be replacing blinds and you go well there's functional obsolescence is a real thing and these blinds get super brittle in florida so after a while i can't really charge the tenant because anybody that touches or moves those blinds they're going to break yeah um but you know but you always are protecting the owner's money and if anything you're always going to side a little bit of caution towards the owner okay and also tenants are going to push you to 
not do that. They're going to try and get you to not never charge them for anything. Mm-hmm. It, but a great property manager doesn't let a tenant push them around. Mm-hmm. You know? So anyway, that's uh, kind of that whole thing. And what if, what if they like break something really expensive and they're like, I just don't have the money. Um, well, generally I'm going to be like, okay, well, we'll put you on a payment plan, but it has to be reasonable. Never longer than their current lease, but I, I get it. If they broke something, you know, it was accidental. Absolutely. Um, you know, we get it. I'm probably going to go to the owner and say, listen, the tenant doesn't have enough money to pay for it today, but they're going to pay $300 a month over the next four months and yeah. pay the 1200 bucks. Um, I'm not going to give them forever because I might even I, I might even say to them, listen, well then you you better go take a second job or go get blood or do something because yeah. you broke this. The other thing is is you also don't have to fix it unless it's necessary. So like if it was an AC, obviously, and they broke it because you know they did something, I mean they hit it with their car or something. Um, obviously, I'm probably going to fix the AC and build them over time. Yeah. Um, another thing that I always recommend though is there's two types of renters insurance. There's renter's insurance a tenant goes and gets, and that protects their belongings. There's another renter's insurance they pay for, but ultimately it protects the, it's it's insurance that if they do anything, break anything, cause any issues, that the owner is covered for that. You want to probably, I'm not, and here's the thing, I don't, I don't actually require it, but I probably should, is it protects your owners from, um, you know, these issues could now they do something like this that insurance policy can be used to pay for that thing mm. you know um you know sometimes too like if a tenant breaks something we're going to bill it against their thing sometimes they don't pay it so if it's and i'm not talking big things i'm talking like 100 bucks you know 80 mm. bucks 90 bucks well we're not going to evict for that but we're just going to let it sit on their account and then when they move out we're going to take that money out of their security deposit got it you know, sometimes they'll want to use the secure deposit to cover it. I'm like, no, you don't get to use the secure deposit. The secure deposit is there for you when you move out completely and you don't owe any money and the use units left, then we're going to give you your money back. But that's to protect the owner against the fact that if you damage something, we have the money to cover that cost. Mm-hmm. So don't use the secure deposit. That's a bad thing. You know, don't let them use that. You know? Do owners ever try to like, get you to make claims for the security deposit? Oh yeah, so I have an owner that, one owner that would every time he had a tenant move out, he'd be like, keep the whole deposit. Yeah. Be, no. Now, your job is, the other thing is, is your job is before you rent a property, you should have full pictures of everything in the property, full video of where you're talking about it, and you should be noting anything that is of issue, because here's the thing, you're not always going to rent perfect properties. Yeah. So, like, I just, I'll give you an example. I had a unit I just rented. One of the tenants, previous tenants, had put a hot pot on it. It's a laminate top. It burned a ring on the thing. The owner's not going to replace the entire kitchen counter because there's a burn ring. Mm. Okay, well, so here's the thing. When the ten, next tenant moves in, I'm going to take a picture of that burn ring, and I'm going to put it in the file so that we know they didn't do it. We're going to put that on their moving report. Tenant didn't cause the burn ring on the counter, but they accepted the unit with the burn ring, and we're just going to move forward. Mm-hmm. You wanted to, I believe that, because also you're building a trust relationship with your tenant. <laughs> so when you take all the pictures, because you also generally have them fill out a move-in form, which they list any issues. Well, what we do is we list issues for them. Mm-hmm. So I'm going to put, um, there was a, uh, you know, there's a, I don't know, a, a, a little indention in the wall. It's not like a, a hole, but there's like a, a mar on the wall. I'm going to put the burn mark. I'm going to put that there's a, you know, the baseboard's a little old and it's kind of not looking that good in the right corner of the bedroom. Why? Because it's a trust thing. I'm, I'm going to point out the bad things because if you don't point them out, then the owner, and let's say you don't manage the unit when they move out, maybe something happens to you, whatever. That tenant's probably going to get charged by the next person that's managing it and they don't deserve to. So I, when we do our move in walk through videos and pictures, we take pictures of everything good, bad and ugly, but then we know the bad and ugly. Yeah, you know, and that way the tenant and, and the tenants appreciate that because they might miss it too. 
Yeah. So our job is to be thorough. Like, I mean, literally my inspection on a, is really like 125, 30 steps because it's like you literally need to go through every inch of the property. Does the, you know, does the cabinet door work or does it not? If it doesn't work, you want to note that because it's not the tenant's fault if a year later they move out and you go, wait, this door doesn't work right, it sticks. Well, we didn't cause that stuff the day we moved in. Well, I don't know about that. You know, yeah. you know what I mean? You don't want to do that to a tenant. You know, you want to you want to do take the time to be meticulous in your in your inspection of the unit before they move in. Take all the pictures, take all the video, talk during the video, because all that's what you want to go to court. Your third thing you're going to get is you're going to have them sign a move in move up, you know, pay piece of paper that and have them list anything. But that's actually the least protective in court. Because it has no evidence to it, it's just yeah, you know, just a work, piece of paper. Right? Um, so just always be in the habit of always taking pictures, always taking video. Okay, that's smart. But if an owner, because it also protects you against that owner, why didn't you charge him for this burn mark? Well, we talked about that a year ago, and you knew about it, and you didn't want to fix it. Yeah, it wasn't their fault. Exactly. So you got to protect against the owner too. I hate to say it, but they'll try and do things too sometimes that, you know, the other thing I put in my contract, I think I told you this is have a clause in your contract that the owner does not have the right or authority to speak to the tenant. Yeah. And then when they ask you why, say because it's my job as a professional to take care of them. And unfortunately, you... I, I, you know, and I'll ask questions. Have you read Florida Statute uh, 83, governing tenants and landlords? No. Have you read the, the fair housing rules and the recent, recent mandates that came out around felons? No. Okay, those are the reasons why I'm not going to let you talk to your tenant. Not because I'm hiding anything from you. I'm protecting yourself from you. Yeah. You're going to do, say, and, and handle things in a manner that don't meet the rules of the game, and it's going to get you and me in trouble. Mm-hmm. My job is to know Florida Statute 83. My job is to have built a lease that works really well for you. My job is to know fair housing rules, and I'm the professional, so let me handle the professional things. Mm -hmm. You know, if they keep kind of pushing, just be like, you know, I like to use comparison. You know, um, you know, you're, you're not, you know, you're not going to talk to the doctor's assistant about your medical issues. Yeah. You're going to talk to the doctor. I'm your doctor. Um, you know, so you just got to come up with good analogies that make them. Some owners are pretty relentless about it. Mm -hmm. When I added that clause to my contract, my team and I, 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 I literally, when I added that clause of contract, which had been around 2018, I said, who's going to fire us? And we all said Diane. She was an owner of mine. Because Diane always was involved with her tenants, but it caused so many issues. Because mm. she always generally had roommate situations, and she'd always pick a side. Yeah. And I'd be like, no. And so, the, seriously, she got the contract. She called and said, I don't want ma you to manage my unit. I want to be engaged with my tenants. I said, Diane, you know what's funny? And I told her this. We voted, and everybody knew this call for me was coming. Because it's, and, and I'm, I'm just going to keep telling you, you're not right. You should never want to talk to your tenants. Yeah. So keep them far away because they're, all, and it's, again, it's not so you can hide stuff. It's not so you can mismanage. It's because they're going to get you in trouble. That also kind of like defeats the point of the property management company. Like, exactly. You're hiring them so they can do the job for you. Exactly. And so that's what I tell them. If you, you know, I, and again, whatever method you think is the best thing to say back to them when they, because people will kind of circle that one when they read your contract. Well, what do you mean I can't talk to the tenant? What are you trying to, people even said, what are you trying to hide something? I'd be like, no, I'm trying to protect you from you. Yeah. You're, you're not an expert in all of these areas. This is a litigation heavy industry. Mm hmm. You can get sued. You'll be threatened. One thing you're going to find is you'll get so many calls when a tenant can't pay rent that they have mold, that they've got asthma, their kids got asthma, their dogs got asthma, their fish has got asthma. They've got a mold issue. And I mean, I'm just, that's one of the biggest things. If you get really good at property management, those calls don't scare you. They don't intimidate you. Even if they're from an attorney, you literally just kick your feet up and go, 
Well, number one, mold is caused 99.9% of the time by the tenant because they don't keep the atmospheric condition of their unit in proper order. That usually shuts up everybody. Yeah. That's true. But 1% of the time or less, it's because there's a water source issue that wasn't dealt with by somebody and it got bad enough to become a mold issue. Mm. That doesn't that doesn't really happen hardly ever. Mm-hmm. Because usually if there's a water issue, you realize there's a water issue before it ever gets to the point of growing mold. Yeah. So, but that's an area where you have to, you know, and it's the same thing. You're, you're basically telling your tenants and your your owners, I'm the expert here, and I know the rules better than you. Let's not mess around with each other. Yeah. Yeah, so. Um... I don't really have any other questions. Okay. Um, yeah. So I would say, you know, just, uh, you know, the other thing, only thing I would say just to add to something is, you know, make sure the brokerage you're going to work for also brings something to the table for you. You know, like I said, is their name well known? Do they have a reputation? Are they offering you training? Are they, you know, because if you're going in and you just forged a relationship and I don't know what you've done but and you're going to kind of step in and start building a management company for them make sure that you get more than just a commission of that or more than just a contract agreement because if you build it for them it's theirs yeah maybe you know like I mean? find a way to get equity in it yeah I mean, like, if I'm going to come in and bust my butt and work hard for you, then I want a piece of the pie long term because let's just, let's look at it again. You bring on that $3,000 a month unit, it makes $300 a month times 12, that's 3600 plus there's other fees from the tenant, other fees, that unit can make $7,000. Yeah. You know, now let's say we there's a 40% expense ratio, so that's 2800 There's still 3200 bucks left there on the table. If you're building that, a big percentage of that should be yours, not the broker's. Yeah. You know, and, I mean, because if not, you're just an employee. Yeah. You know, so I'm just saying, like, if you're going to go and build out uh, something for somebody, especially if they're not a big, huge company that has is bringing you a lot, advertising dollars here's the thing if you were doing nothing they're paying for all the advertising they've got all the computers the offices the they get you a truck or whatever you know i'm just saying you know throwing up things out there well then yeah you got to give up more and more of that pie yeah but if you're building it and doing it mostly just organically yourself then you need most of that pie yeah yeah you know? And ultimately, the best thing I can say is obviously kind of be where I'm at, where you work in the industry for two years long enough to get your broker's license. And get it. But you can also, here's the truth, you can also own your own management company, run your own show and be the only principal on the business and have a, a, just a guy that allows you to use his license. He doesn't need to, you know, ultimately own it. Mm-hmm. You know, I'm just saying, don't, 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 don't end up kind of getting into a situation where after you work your butt off and build up a hundred units, you're disposable. Yeah, you know? that's something so, I gotta talk to him with about. Yeah, you know, this should be, hey, I'm coming in to grow us this for us, and the, the bigger it grows, the more I should get, the less you should take. Yeah. You know, depending on how much you get. I mean, if you're using all his resources, like I said, advertising dollars, I don't know what. But get that all in writing, too, because I just got off the phone with somebody that didn't get something in writing, and it cost them almost $250,000. Okay. You know, so, you know, I, I always say this. A man's word is great. A man's word on a document that everybody can read is better because now everybody can show you what your personality is really like if you don't keep your word. Yeah. <laughs> you know, so... You know, I am just saying, I mean, I've made these mistakes too where I haven't put things in writing and been very, the other thing is be very clear as much as you can. Obviously, you can't see every issue you're going to have in a relationship, but try and think about as many, um, you know, you know, you know, make sure that, you know, I mean, you try and think of as many pitfalls that can come up in the relationship on day one mm -hmm. and put them into an agreement so that everybody understands, you know. It's like something as simple as this. If you build a deck in Florida and you don't have the contractor define what kind of screws they're going to use, they could use a, a screw that rusts in like 
two months because it was super humid and rainy. Or you can, you know, it, it, but if you don't, if you don't clarify there, because the screws that don't rust, the stainless ones or whatever, those are expensive. Yeah. So now you get a deck and they put all the screws in that are, you know, they used indoor school screws. You know, six months later, your deck looks like it's 50 years old. Yeah. I'm just saying that's, those are the little things sometimes we don't think about that we need to have in the contract. Okay. That makes sense? Yeah, it does. So really, you know, I think what I would say to you is slowly, meticulously think things through before you jump. And that may sound difficult because I know you want to get things moving, but the better you think about them, the, the, the harder it is for you to, to, to get burned on the other side. Mm -hmm. so, yeah. So. All right. Well, thank you for this call. Um, <laughs> So we'll go back to uh, Wednesdays next week. Uh, sorry about uh, not having my ringer on. I was in a meeting on Tuesday night, and it, when my phone went off, I shut it off, and then I completely spaced, turned it back on. So all good, no problem. But but uh, so and um, and as you're going through this process with this broker and negotiating things, you know if you you know if he presents things to you or he says things to you, and you want to talk to me about them, I'm more than happy to you know take a five minute call here or there if you need to. So. I will. I'll keep you in touch. Sounds perfect. All right. Thanks. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Uh, thank you for watching. Please subscribe. Uh, stay tuned for more.